Our children had a great time at preteen camp. Thank you for praying for them. Three of our boys and girls came to know Jesus that week and trusted Him as Savior. And just a wonderful week. So thank you for supporting them and praying for our children while they were at camp. There is <clears throat> there's an area of life that most Christians don't feel has anything to do with a Christian life. And, and, and they don't feel like there's a, a connection between the two. And here's what the connection is. They feel like there's a disconnect between this and this. They don't think it relates. And so most Christians feel like, well, you know, money is secular and, and a necessary evil, and it's worldly. God isn't interested in it. Now, the spiritual life, that's different. That's faith and prayer and heaven, and that's what God's interested in. And so they believe there's a disconnect between our finances and the Christian life. So a lot of them feel like, well, I, I know I should give money to the church and give to God every now and then to help out the church. But the bottom line is, God really doesn't care how much I give. He doesn't care how I spend the rest of my money. And he's more concerned with greater things like my soul. Boy, are they wrong. Because there is a vital connection between between this and God for a Christian. In fact, this is a, is a mirror into this. More than 2,000 times in the Bible, money and possessions are talked about. 2,000. Prayer is mentioned about 500 times. <laughs> In fact, money is talked about five times more than prayer and faith combined. That's incredible. Jesus spoke 38 parables in the New Testament. 16 of them. 16 out of 38 had to do with money possessions. That's almost one half. Why do you think the Bible talks so much about money? I believe it's because God knew it would be a struggle for us. So he talked about it. Now I know a lot of people say, well pastor you, you can't really talk about money on Sunday morning. People don't want to hear it and and you know, they don't want to hear about tithing and all of that. They, they get angry, and, and if we have guests here, they're, they're not going to come back. But folks, if the Bible talks about it 2,000 times, I would be wrong not to talk about it. I don't talk about it much. But there are things I think we need to address in what it says. Now, we're going through a five-week sermon series on Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and, and one theme per Sunday we're looking at. And we looked at the concept of chokmah, C-H-O-K-M-A-H. It's a Hebrew word that means wisdom. It recurs over and over and over throughout the book of Proverbs. The English is closer to the word skill. Chokmah in the Hebrew culture, back in Scripture and even today, is a revered word. In fact, I found out, so it, 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 also in Arabic, I found out last week that in Arabic, the, 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 the uh, brother of that word is called hekmah, same concept. And in Arabic, I don't know if it's this way in Hebrew or not, but in Arabic, the average person can't even say the word. It takes a wise old sage to even speak the word. So it's a concept that's highly revered. And what the concept in Hebrew is, the concept is there is a design to life as to how you build your life. It's not just you do you and God's going to bless you. It's a concept that you take your life and you fit it into the design God has for you, and that is the life that's best lived. 
is there, there is a design God has for life. And whenever you fit into that design, life is a little better. Now this morning, if there's never been a time in your life that you've received Christ as Savior, you pray to receive Jesus into your heart and life, submitted your life to Him, then that's the first step in hope mind, living a better life, is being a Christian. But this morning, if you're not a Christian, what I'm about to say about giving does not apply to you. God never asks unbelievers to give a penny. So if you're lost this morning, never receive Christ as Savior, this message is not for you. You don't have to give a dime when you're here. But it's not good for you when you die. Those of you who are believers, the message is directly to you and me. So let's look at what he has to say. Now, in the, through Proverbs, we've looked at, first of all, the tongue. You can't live life well if, you're, if you can't control your tongue. Second week, week, we looked at anger. You can't live the best life God has designed for you if you can't control your temper. Last week, we talked about relationships, family relationships, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to be a good child, how to be a good parent. And, and that's important to live your best life. How do you fit into the family structure? This morning, we're going to look at living your best life has to do with your finances. Because God has a lot to say about it. So let's look this morning at three areas or actions money can cause you to take. Three actions money can cause you to take. Number one, money can cause you to make unwise decisions. Number one, money can make you make or cause you to make unwise decisions. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Now, the proverb, the word inherits means possession. So possessions you've gotten hastily. The word means greedy. So things that you've gotten because you're greedy in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Sometimes we get what we have because of greed. We get it immorally. We get it by cutting corners ethically. And that's not going to be blessed. Sometimes we make unwise decisions in getting money. God said, I'll not bless that. Now, as you look at Scripture, money is actually neutral. It's neither good nor bad. A lot of people think, oh, money's, money's evil. The Bible says money's evil. No, no. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is neutral. It's what you do with it. If you look at the Old Testament, some of the godliest men were some of the wealthiest men of their day. Abraham. He's a wealthy man, but he believed God and was counted for righteousness. Job was a wealthy man, but a godly man. Joseph, a wealthy man, but a godly man. David, a man after God's own heart, a wealthy man. Solomon, wealth so much that people travel from other countries to come look at it. He was a godly man. So some of the wealthiest were some of the godliest. So money's neutral. But it can cause you to make some unwise decisions. Look at Proverbs 22, verses 1 and 2. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Keep your good name. Keep integrity. Make wise, ethical decisions in getting money. I was pastoring my first church. I was outside of Greenville and I'd been there a couple of years and another church a large church contacted me what I did I was interested in coming as pastor and my pay increase went a lot 
And I was talking to a close friend of mine, and I was telling them about this, and they said, well, you've got to take the church. It's, I mean, it's more money. Is that how we think? If it's more money, I've got to do it. No, I didn't go. I turned down the church. Because sometimes if you make decisions based only on money, you make the wrong choice. It can cause you to do some things that are unwise. Follow God's direction. And don't simply just follow the money. Look at Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with a food that's needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So the writer of Proverbs is saying, Dear God, don't give me too little. And don't give me too much. Give me just enough. You ever prayed that? Probably not. We, we like the part, don't give me too little, but don't give me too much. Maybe you don't have more because you can't handle more. Maybe if you had more, you would forsake the Lord. I've seen people do it. If you aren't faithful with what you have, why would God give you more? Oh, pastor, if I had more, I would be faithful. You would be just exactly doing what you're doing right now. And so the writer of Proverbs says, be careful Money can cause you to make some unwise decisions, cost you your family, cost you your spiritual life, cost you peace of mind, cost you being in God's will. But here's the second action that money can cause you to take. Money can cause you to trust the wrong source. Money can cause you to trust the wrong source. Look at Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He or other whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. He that trusts, the word literally means confidence, in riches will fall, the word means cast down, but the righteous will sprout like a bud and flourish like a green leaf. So many people trust their wealth. They trust their assets. They trust their bank account, their 401K, their retirement to give them peace of mind, to give them security. But folks, the stock market can crash. You can lose your assets. How many times have we seen when the stock market goes down and crashes and people lose thousands and millions, sometimes billions, they commit suicide over it? Do you remember those stories? The last one, a man lost billions, young man in his 30s, lost billions, jumped out of a, of a hotel window in New York and killed himself. That's trusting the wrong source. Because everything you have can be gone. It can be taken. We are to trust with all of our hearts and lean not to our own understanding, the Lord. Look at Proverbs 28, 25. A greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. Somebody who's always interested in, in money there are things always being stirred up. Whenever you place your confidence in possessions, something's always stirring in your heart. Have I got enough? Is it in the right account? Am I getting the right interest rate? Should I be investing in something else? Should I do something else? It's always keeping you stirred up. But those that trust in the Lord, he said, they're enriched. 
Now, we think it's the opposite. We think, well, if you trust in, in possessions, that will bring you peace. If my bank account's good, if my, stock, my stocks are good, if everything's good, if I'm feeling good about retirement, whoo, that brings me peace. Now, trust in the Lord. He sometimes he do, acts, sometimes he doesn't, and that, that's what is uncertain. We think it's the opposite of what the proverb just said. It's not. Trusting in God is your peace, your enrichment. Trusting in what you have. Strife is always stirred up. More than 60 proverbs are about money. 60. Here are some of the topics that are covered in Proverbs. How you make your money. Co-signing for a loan. Should you do that or should you not? Bribes. Taking bribes is covered. Greed is covered. Prosperity is covered. Your inheritance you leave for your kids, that's covered. Debt is covered. Immorality is covered. Deception is covered. The Proverbs talk a lot about all of these. There are many ways to trust in money over trusting God. So be careful. So I'll ask you a question. Who do you trust the most? God or what you have? Now I know the church answers God. Everybody go, oh, pastor, God. But be honest. What do you trust the most? And then the third and, and final action that money can cause us to take. Money can cause you, number three, to be disobedient to God. Money can cause you to be disobedient to God. The Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear on what you give to God, how much you give, how often you give. These are all issues of obedience to God, and He commands us to give a certain percentage of what we make to Him. If you're a Christian. Now, you may say, well, Pastor, how do you know all of us aren't doing that? Well, one sign is that this summer here at First Baptist Church, our attendance is up and our giving's down. That's one sign. In fact, we are giving $120,000 less this summer than we gave last summer. But more of you are here. So that, I guess that's one sign. I want you to listen to what Proverbs 3 says. It's a fascinating passage. Verses 9 and 10. Look at it. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Would you notice what he said there? Honor the Lord. The, the word honor is kavod. It's a popular Hebrew word. It means heavy. Heavy down the Lord with your substance. Your wealth, your riches, things you have. And with the first fruits, that's the beginning. The word means beginnings. It means choice part. Of all of your increase, the yield so shall your barns. God makes a promise. You do that, your barns, your storehouse will be filled full with plenty, and your possessions will burst with new wine. That's his promise. So the interpretation is really simple. We are to give God of our riches, of what we're paid, first, the beginning, as soon as we get it. Of all that we get, that's called the tithe. The word tithe means tenth. 
one-tenth. That's the command. And then God's promise is what you have will be plenty left over. Let me summarize verses 9 and 10. God said, if you honor me with the first 10%, the first fruits, I will stretch the other 90%. You'll do fine. You'll do fine. That's a principle, not from the pastor, but from God. Now, go back to the Old Testament. God's people, the Israelites, here here are the commands God gave them concerning the tithe, 10%. Here's what he told them. First of all, he said, everybody gives the tithe. Everybody, no exceptions. Little kids, teenagers, everybody, no exceptions. If you're my child, you bring the tithe, 10%. 10% of your fruit, of your cattle, of your sheep, of your grain. That's what they had to live on. Everything you have to live on, 10%, first 10%, you bring it. Everybody, no exceptions. Then he said, it's mandatory, it's not optional. It's not giving as you feel. It's mandatory. In fact, the wording he used in Hebrew is the same wording of giving taxes. Now, we don't like to think of giving to God like giving to the government. We don't like to think of giving our tithes as giving taxes. But God used the same terminology to the Israelites. Well, as time went on, the Israelites took these commands and they, um, they began to relax them. They didn't give the full tithe. They would give not 10%, they would give maybe 5%. And then they'd give about 3%. And then they give about 2%. By the way, the average Christian gives 2%. Give about 2%. And so, by the time of Malachi, God sent a prophet named Malachi, and here's what he told him. Chapter 3, verse 10. Look on your screen. Malachi 3.10. He told them, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. That was the church, the temple. That there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. That's the same thing Proverbs said. You bring the full tithe, I'll provide for you. Now, you may say, well, pastor, we're we're not in the Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament. We're not under law. We're under grace because of Christ. And you're right. So I've often heard tithing is Old Testament. It's not New Testament. So therefore, we're not to tithe anymore. We just give what we want. But hold on. Matthew 23, 23 is in the New Testament. Look at what Jesus said. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe! mint and dill and cumin those spices out of your cabinet and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faithfulness but don't miss the last sentence these you ought to have done justice mercy and faithfulness without neglecting the others hold hold on a second did he just say you're to keep tithing i think he did those Pharisees were so meticulous, they gave money, they, gave, they even gave the spices out of their kitchen cabinet. And God's saying, you're so particular about those tithes, but you hate people. You need to be focusing on the weightier matters of the law. But hold on, don't neglect the tithing. And that's New Testament. Plus, think about this. If God was so meticulous in the Old Testament with the Israelites of bringing the tithe and it has to be a certain amount, so meticulous, why then in the New Testament does he give us the freedom just to pitch in a couple of bucks in the offering plate? That doesn't make sense. Grace in the New Testament is not less than law. 
In fact, it's greater than law. Because Jesus was talking about the law, and he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and whatever was said, he raised the bar. So if anything, grace-giving ought to be more than the Old Testament. So it's very much a command for us. Now let me share some, some principles, what Scripture talks about concerning the tithe for a moment. The word tithe, of course, means 10%. 10% of everything I get, any kind of check I get for doing anything, 10% of it is God's, it's not mine, so I, I give it to the church, 10%. An offering is anything above the 10%. There's no set amount for that. It could be a dollar, it could be $10, it could be a million dollars. The offering is up to you. But the tithe is set. That's the 10% that we bring to God. We give that 10% at the beginning of our paycheck, not after all the bills are paid. I've often heard people say, Pastor, I just, I get all my bills paid because I feel like I have a responsibility to them first, and then what's left over, I don't have 10% left over. That's because you give 10% to God first, and He takes the other 90% and blesses it, and it works. Not only that, the tithe must be paid consistently. Sometimes we, we're hit and miss with it. We pay it one time and then we don't the next pay period and we pay it another time and we miss two or three pay periods and then we pay it one time and we keep missing and we're just kind of hit and miss with it. But it is to be paid, according to God from the Old Testament, every single time we gain something. 10% goes to him. Sometimes we hear, you hear a message like this and our giving goes up for a week or two and then it goes down. But it's to be consistent. Consistently giving God what he has required. And everybody's to tithe. Not just the wealthy. Not just the older. Everybody. If you're a Christian. At First Baptist Church, most of our giving comes from the first service, not the service. Most of it comes from people 55 and older because they've been taught to tithe. But it's not just on them. It's all of us. In fact, if you, if you think about it, we have a built-in excuse our entire life never to tithe. If you're a child, well, I, I don't make much. I get an allowance. What's 10% of that going to be? It's not the amount. It's the fact you're obedient. A teenager. Uh, okay, I'm working at McDonald's. I don't get much. What's 10% going to be? It's obedience. But then you move into young adulthood. I got a family. I'm paying for school and clothes and books. And oh my goodness, I'm trying to get my career established. I, I can't tithe. And then you move to median adulthood. Well, I'm getting ready for retirement. I need to put everything into my retirement. I'll not have enough. And then you go to senior adulthood. I'm on fixed income. I can't tithe. And we, for our entire lives, have built in excuses not to tithe. But the bottom line is either we do or we don't. And I have trouble believing that God would say, I'm sorry, you gave 10% to me. You should have kept it. You're going to starve. You're faithful to him. He'll be faithful to you. And did you notice that the tithe is brought to the storehouse? The storehouse was what was beside the temple that took care of the temple's needs. So we're to bring the tithe to God's house. Not to a friend who needs it. Not to a family member who needs a little helping. We bring it to God's house. Now, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I used, to, I used to do that. I was guilty of that. When I first went into ministry, I, I would take the tithe, 10% of what I had, and if I saw somebody who had a need, I'd give it to them. Or another, another pastor, I helped many times in a small church and 
And so I, I helped him, and that was my tithe. And God convicted me through this passage, you don't take my money and do something else with it. You want to help them, help them with your money. My money goes to the storehouse. That's where I said, bring it. So I started bringing it to the church house. Whether the church needed it or not was immaterial. Whether we were over budget or under budget was immaterial. I brought it because God told me to do it as obedience to my family and me. We still do. Hadn't stopped. So it is brought to the storehouse. You wouldn't take your $400 electric bill this summer. Well, maybe more than that now all this air, all this is. But you wouldn't take your $400 electric bill instead of giving it to an electric company, give it to a family member because they're struggling, would you? Electric company call you, uh, you haven't paid your bill. Oh, sure I have. I, I gave it to my friend who's hurt. They, they need it worse than you do. That wouldn't go with electric company, would it? It doesn't with God either. So bring it to the storehouse. You may say, well, pastor, if, if I gave actually 10% of what I make, do you know how much money that would be? i got a simple solution. Go to your closet, get on your knees, and say, Dear God, would you please reduce my income so my tithe check doesn't look so big? Simple. Now, a lot of people out, Pastor, I, I can't afford to tithe. I just can't. I don't have enough. But we have monthly subscriptions to Netflix and Hulu and Spotify and SiriusXM and Amazon Prime and iHeartRadio and Apple TV and Disney and Beauty Fix and Sling and YouTube TV and Apple Music and Lifetime Fitness and Allure Beauty Box and Stitch Fix and Trade Coffee and Atlas Coffee Club and Ipsy and you name it. We pay those consistently. I don't have enough money to tithe. God's not fooled. He, he's no fool. He watches. And he knows. So, just to be honest, this church should never lack any resources, ever. If 100% of us give God what, simply what he commanded, we'd have plenty to do ministry that he's called us to and my prayer every single day is 100 percent of our members 100 percent of the members of our church tithe for two reasons it's obedience number one but we would have plenty in ministry to do what god's called us to do i get the same amount no matter how much we take in <laughs> i don't get more so that's my prayer. And someone, someone said, well, Pastor, I, that's unrealistic to pray for 100% of our members. Just pray that more people will. No, no. One, why should I let some people be disobedient? I'm praying for 100%. And those that consider us to be their church. A lot of people watch online. They consider us to be their church. They owe it as well. Every one of us. Obedience. Now, one more proverb. We'll close. 23 verses 4 and 5. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it's gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings and flies like an eagle toward heaven. It, Proverbs is saying the more you focus your eyes on wealth, all of a sudden it grows wings and takes off be careful where you focus your eyes I am holding a $100 bill Ben Franklin I got it out of the offering plate last Sunday no I didn't I'm teasing I did not I'm joking $100 bill, holding it out. When I hold it out from me and I look right in Ben Franklin's eyes, with my peripheral vision, I can still see the balcony. I see all the lower level with my periphery. But I bring it closer. 
I don't see any of the balcony now. I see the lower level with my periphery. I bring it closer. I don't see any of the middle section. I can see this side. I can see this side. I can see the corners. But I don't see the middle section now. I bring it closer and I don't see the balcony or the middle section. I can see this side. I can see this side. I can see the front row. I bring it closer and I don't see anything but Ben. I don't see any of you. The closer you bring this to you, the less you see of anything else. So be careful. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for your word. Sometimes it's hard to hear, I know. But Father, as you look down upon this church, my great desire as pastor is that you see an obedient people. We're doing what you told us to do. Father, forgive us of where at times we get like the days of Malachi and we, we reduce the 10 down to 8 and 5 and 4 and 2 percent or none. And dear God, may you speak to our hearts today and help your people realize that how much we give and how we spend the rest of it is vitally important to you. There's no disconnect. So may we trust you. Father, I pray for any today that this sermon was not to because they don't know you as Savior. Lord, I pray today during this invitation, you'll speak to their hearts. They'd walk up, trust Jesus as Savior, have an eternity that's different. Be on a road to heaven, have a better life. God, may they make that decision today as well. In Jesus' name I pray.